So uh, welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've been uh, looking forward to this chat. It's a topic that's been uh, talked about on the podcast here before. Uh, so who are you? Who am I? Um, well, uh, so I'm an American uh, emergency physician. Um, I uh, grew up in uh, New Mexico, Colorado, the West in general. Um, I um, started uh, my interest in sort of what what I'm doing right now uh, actually started uh, from university. I went to University of Texas at Austin and studied uh, uh, physical anthropology, which was, you know, the evolution of uh, human behavior, the ev evolution of primate behavior, hmm. and the origin of evolution, uh, the origin and evolution of um, emotions was what I was specifically interested in. Wow. So I uh, studied chimpanzee, yeah. um, chimpanzee laughter, and uh, wrote a thesis on um, the sort of immunology of uh, the chimpanzee laughter response. And at this time, this is the early 90s, uh, where uh, most people at that time thought only humans had laughter. It was a, it was a human response. Um, and uh, but most primatologists knew that uh, at least a number of different primates laughed, but we we couldn't <laughs> prove that their laughter was like ours. So I did some tests on their saliva after they were tickled to compare their laughter to our laughter. So you can actually test the saliva. Yeah. To... So yeah, when you laugh, you um, uh, produce higher levels of uh, this immune element called immunoglobulin A in your saliva and all your secretions. Um, so I was able to sort of track that and show that their uh, laughter response when they do this sort of like <laughs> that, that was actually the same uh, uh, physiologic response as what hmm. we called laughter. Um, and uh, and then I, I did some work with uh, with that followed up on that on um, on humans with uh, showing that you could increase that um, immune element in your breast milk if you were breastfeeding. So women who laughed more were able to increase the passive immunity that they give their babies. So if because in the first six months of life you don't have this part of your immune system called the humoral immunity, uh, which is funny because it's called the humoral immunity, humoral but it has no, immune, nothing yeah. to do with uh, humor, <laughs> but it's the humors, like the juices. Mm. Um, yeah, anyway, so, I've, so... So you can tickle a pregnant mother. Yes. And that will... <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't tickle them. I had them watch uh, funny videotapes. Of, yeah. Um, and that uh, affects the milk. It increases the immune uh, the quality of their breast milk that they wow. give to their babies. Yeah, so that that for me uh, proves that you know how important it is to be a happy pregnant woman. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and a happy person in general. But yeah, that that's uh, important. Mm. Um, so uh so this is just to say that so my interest in what i'm doing now started in uh from that this interest in how our emotions are connected to our body our our um, immune system endocrine system everything the what's called the psycho neuro uh psycho neuro immunology endocrinology um and uh started actually the first time I, I so shortly after that I finished um, right after I finished uh, university in that chimpanzee study um, I first came to Norway in it was like 20 I don't know 23 years ago or something um, 
And at that time, I was studying uh, Russian literature in Russia. And I went from the winter in Russia to a month in Trondheim during December. Mm. It was totally dark and yeah. miserable. The sun <laughs> never came up that entire <laughs> month. And I was reading Dostoevsky and, you know, laying on the couch, eating too much cake and wine and just this very kushli winter Yule in, for my first Norwegian. Uh, and I got a, just a little touch of what I thought was winter depression. Yeah. Um, uh, which was essentially just reading Dostoevsky in the dark for a month. Uh, but <laughs> That's um, only a month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then I... Uh, uh, that made me interested in, in that a little bit. So I uh, did my first study on depression with a uh, Norwegian uh, researcher, a um, guy named Ode Linyard at Gaustad there, you know, 22 years ago or so, mm. um, on how uh, we, uh, it was a study about how the winter depression and light therapy affected your, um, your bones. And, that's what that was but um what did you figure out um well we didn't if you remember <laughs> yeah we didn't find a difference so we thought that there essentially there would be the bone density of people with winter depression would be lower uh for a variety of reasons but uh i think what happened was in norway there's all these other factors of people replenishing the um their vitamin d and other things that that compensated for it yeah so, um but uh so my interest in uh in mental health was quite a long time ago but uh then i went into uh after medical school i went into emergency medicine which is different they don't have that here it's a specialty where you're um you do everything that's an emergency uh, the acute Motak, um, not Legavacht, but in the uh, the serious emergencies. Mm. Um, and it's everything. So you do anesthesia, medicine, surgery, uh, little sort of just the first parts of everything, but including uh, emergency psychiatry. Yeah. So, so as an emergency physician, I've worked for the last two decades with uh, emergency psychiatry as one of the many you know things so emergency psychiatry meaning that when uh emergency happens the people come to you or meaning that yeah so so like in norway they um so if you have a suicide attempt or you're yeah. psychotic you would go to the acute psychiatric mm. uh Motok. Yeah. Whereas in the US, uh, it's an emergency physician who does the kind of first 12 to 24 hours of everything, um, including the um, severely depressed people or psychotic uh, or suicide attempts. Um, so, um, and then um, this is a really long answer to your question, but uh, that's what podcasts uh, are for. Yeah. We're getting um, we're getting to the ketamine and MDMA later. Yeah, so yeah. people can wait. Um, so uh, so so I practiced emergency medicine for the last twenty years, and then um, when I first I moved here ten years ago, um, and because there was an emergency medicine, I couldn't work uh, here. Um, I tried. I worked at Ahu's. Uh, uh, in there, with the acute motok, but you can you only do a part of what you're trained to do. Mm. So it was only the medicine part. Um, and uh, but essentially, for the last decade, uh, I was commuting every month, uh, working in an emergency department in the U.S. And then um, and then I had three weeks here mm. uh, vacation, which was great. But I was looking for something else to do while I was here. So yeah. I did a master's in public health at the university. Um, Why did you want to go back to Norway all the time? Well, I mean, we moved here. We were yeah. kids 
uh, my wife. Uh, so we lived here, but I was working in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, so I did uh, some, looked into uh, public health so that I could. I was thinking I would just work in Africa for Medicine Sans Frontiers, or just sort of shift into something else that I could do more in Europe uh, or other places, but not go all the way back to the U.S. Mm. And um, and looking and in, you know, public health, uh, you, you know, you, you get the big picture, which, you know, you in the emergency room, you see, I mean, you see everything, um, but you don't get the, the big context of the global context of these, um, the illnesses that were taken care of and and it was very narrow down huh? like well you're just you know on, you're just focusing on, on what is there car accidents yeah, heart course. attacks everything um and in the uh studying international uh public health i was kind of blown away at how big of a problem uh mental health yeah. uh, illness um you know this was uh um, you know, that uh, today, essentially, you know, the, the leading cause of disability in the world is depression. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, l- last year, about a million people killed themselves. Um, and that's at least last year it was you know, more people than died in every war, every natural disaster. Yeah. Died by suicide. And then for every person that you have who dies by suicide, you have the people, the many more that attempted suicide. Mm. And then you have the many more that are suicidal that didn't attempt, and the many more that are just really depressed, uh, yeah. but not suicidal. And so again, this, like beyond that, it's also everyone that gets affected by, ha- by yeah. having someone who is depressed or yeah. suicidal yeah. or, yeah. Absolutely, so is it's, uh, enormous enormous amount of suffering uh in the world right now and um so um so i was impressed by that um and uh and also i was thinking that you know in in emergency medicine you save life um you uh give people time so somebody comes in with a heart attack you restart their heart and they have um say they have a really shitty life uh they they're dead they're alive and then they still have a shitty life Hmm. and now of course you know increasing people's time alive is an important thing to do um but uh more and more i kind of realized that i would like to be focusing on two things one um how can you increase the quality of the life that we have and not just the quantity? Um, and, uh, and two, how can you change or how could I change things so that uh, there is a sustainable exponential change? Um, wow. In, you know, if you save somebody's life, that's great or, you know, on an individual basis. Um, But to some extent, you over time begin to realize that you're a guy in a sinking boat with a bucket. And it's important for that guy to be there with that bucket. For sure. But if there's a way that you can change the direction of the river of suffering or, you know, Mm. fix the boat in some way. And that's... uh, what I've moved into in the in the last uh, five six years is is um, you know trying to make systemic uh, change um, both in our healthcare system and also uh, working for new ways to uh, to treat people in in uh, more effective ways and. Um, um, uh, you know, to make people's lives better and to make our society better. That's an amazing mission, huh? It's very interesting. 
as you say, and that's I think uh, an issue for a lot of doctors that you know uh, it's like a never-ending loop of those kinds of illnesses and damages, and they just continue, and and you know. Uh, at the parallel as you are doing now, we have to work on the cause and you know fix the bigger picture, fix the longer mm, in mm. in the longer line. You know, as you said, you can you can come to a doctor; they are very good at fixing the problem there and then, like restarting your heart or you know fixing your broken bone or or your cuts or something like that. But uh, then, kind of usually, their job is finished. Mm, and mm. then you go back home and your life sucks and then it's like okay how much time will it take before you get back to this you know situation yeah yeah no i, I think that's a really important point um that has to happen in parallel um because um the you know it's it's one thing you know to help people that are suffering but why are we suffering mm. that's a you know we need to why are so many people uh, suffering today? Um, uh, and I, like, what do we know about that? Why is it in increasing? Uh, do we have theories? Do we have? Yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's a lot of it's uh, multifactorial, super complex, and you know, is different in different places, mm. but. Um, my perspective is that it's I you know come from this kind of um, evolutionary perspective, and uh, I think um, one of the the primary factors is um, you could call it a paleo deficit disorder. Um, not my term, but uh, essentially it's a it's a discordant mismatch between the lives that we live and the lives that we've lived for millions of years. Yeah. And there's many aspects of that, but it's really easy to see that this here is not what this organism evolved to do. This is what we do now, mm. um, but this is not uh, the, the, the environment that uh, our organism has evolved to be in homeostasis with over millions and millions of years and yeah. things don't just you know you, we adapt um, but there's many systems including our brain uh, that are adapted to something entirely different um, you know the the world that we live in today um, we've just lived in for you know hundreds of years basically a tiny tiny bit and uh you know uh, right now the majority of people in the world live in cities um in the western world 90 percent of your life is spent in a box you know uh, like in a in room a, in, a, inside in, inside yeah what Under, one, say it one more time 90 percent of our lives are spent inside <sighs> some room building ah. under fake lights um, without nature mm. you know we can have some plants yeah, but, i have a lot of but, plants uh, <laughs> to um, work with it but uh, you know and not uh, to mention the amount of time that we spend in a virtual environment with in yeah. front of our phones and uh, computers and screens um, and so there's um it's 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 out of balance, and uh, you know I think uh, that's that's the primary. So that as a as an umbrella, I think that's the primary thing. And within that is our lack of contact with nature, um, our um, lack of contact with people. Mm. You know we we think we're social. But living in cities is actually tremendously isolating compared to our evolutionary passive. You you know, like villages and smaller well, communities. Even villages and, are relatively yeah. uh, new as well. Evolutionary, um, you know, um, tribes. The, most of our our existence has been spent, uh, you know, just small bands of. 
people, you know, less than 50 people, mm. uh, you know, everybody completely interdependent and knowing each other and depending on each other and caring for each other and spending time with each other, sitting mm. around the fire, looking at the stars, going hunting together, gathering together. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, connect connection with nature, social, uh, uh, social interaction. Um, yeah, and within so social interaction is also that you, as you said, you feel now that you are more social, also based on your your usage of like social media, mm -hmm. which mm. you maybe think is a social thing, but you know. How much do you actually talk to the people there and how much time are you on social media mm. just scrolling and looking and like endlessly looping in yeah. different kinds of stuff mm. Mm. yeah 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 we uh you're gonna talk to my wife another time but uh we did the last film that i worked on with her was um it was called play again um which we made i guess about 10, 11 years ago, um, which is uh, focusing on this, you know, what are the consequences, not a lot of films have focused on what are the consequences of that screen time, but what are the consequences of what you're not doing when you're <laughs> having that screen time? That was uh, that. So um, we took these kids, you know, normal average kids who grew up in a city who had never been camping. Some of them had never seen the Milky Way, um, you know, just normal city kids. Yeah. And, um, you know, brought them out into nature. And, and uh, that's becoming the new normal. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different factors and, um, but um but that's certainly a big one yeah so we have okay that's all of these stuff are what's happening with people in this you know world why is this um uh, turning you into depression anxiety ptsd um for people like um, is it because we are As you said, less in nature, less with people. Uh, do, do we know anything about what happens in our brain? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there used to, um, you know, we used to have this uh, concept that, um, that there's all these different, very specific disorders um, that are separate, depression, anxiety, um you know so each diagnosis and there's this thing called the dsm the Diag diagnostic and statistical manual in the us which is sort of the standard of you know this all if you meet all these 15 criteria then okay you have major depressive episode or mm. um or uh, generalized anxiety disorder or something um, but the thing is, it was it was um, it, it was developed on just symptoms, so it, it's kind of like uh, if we um, learned about our disease processes uh, by saying, okay, so there's this thing where you you have a fever and you get a rash and you have um, your heart rate is fast. Okay, then then you have this. We'll call it this disease. Um, but there was very very little connection to what's actually causing that. Well, it's a bacteria that you have an infection, you know. So th so wh whereas in a lot of other types of medicine, we have it. We've gone down to the basics of, of what is the etiology of the symptoms, and and then describing the. Um, uh, Uh, the disorder based on that physiology psychiatry kind of went the other way or hmm. it, it took a lot longer um, to really start to you know the brain has been a bit of a black box and it still is um, so it, it's more 
Is it more complicated or complex, well, or well, it's did we just start complex, at the? But one of the things that we're realizing now with brain imaging um, uh, techniques um, is that um, the different disorders um, are, uh, you know, that there's a lot of overlap, and um, and that there is uh, so there's something called. Um, a concept called chronic stress pathology, um, which is that, um, f- so we all have genetic predisposition for uh, depression, say, for example. Um, you know, so we think about maybe 50% of sort of the cause of your depression is sort of your genetic threshold. Um, and so, so it's like already programmed that we are well you know, we have no no um, but um, but your threshold is uh-huh yeah. so so in other words uh, some people have genes that um, that they can have a wonderful life everything is perfect and yet they suffer from terrible depression hmm. uh, other people have genes um, that you know they have trauma after trauma and neglect and misery and just catastrophe in their life and they're really happy yeah, people and so um, strange and then there's you know most people are kind of in between yeah. uh if if there's enough bad stuff that happens to you you will uh respond to those stressors with depression or uh anxiety so so uh essentially um you know, is at least for depression and anxiety, they're what they are. They're normal responses to um, stress. Yeah. And uh, you know, with this, and you're given a certain threshold. Um, and so, what happens in the brain is, um, is I can, some of what happens in the brain yeah. is, is so if you have uh, chronic stress. Um, either really traumatic things happen to you, uh, you know, a few traumatic things or one traumatic thing, or that's, uh, or if it's just a lot of little things, um, uh, that's just enough to kind of keep you stressed over a long period of time. Um, particularly when the brain is developing, and this is, we're talking the first two and a half decades of your life. So it's huge, a lot of space to have stress. Mm. Uh, so um, and there's a lot of stuff happening those years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, uh, so during that period of brain development, if if you have um, enough bad stuff happen, or just an insecure, uh, uh, you know, upbringing where you know maybe there wasn't quite enough. Uh, care there, love uh, from uh, from the people around you, or there was, you know, more severe stressful things that happen. Um, the um, the brain response, and this is you know, chron- so acute stress is good for you. It's a it's a adaptive response that allows you to respond to the situation, um, which but- was like from our ancestors yeah yeah when you met a tiger yeah it, that's a good thing to run you know absolutely yeah <laughs> um but but then chronic stress um or you know which comes from a single trauma or many traumas over time if that stress doesn't go away uh it's very maladaptive and all kinds of bad stuff happens and so one of the things that happens in the brain of depressed people is that um, you actually have decreased numbers of connections and branches between the brain cells. So you can actually do neuroimaging of a depressed patient, and there's actually um, less, um, you know, so every thought feeling you have is uh, sort of a, if you had a microscope, it's a pattern of millions and millions of brain cells talking to each other with these branches 
and then synapses, the, the connections that they transport, you know, neurotransmitters. And, um, and so there's, it's almost like the brains of uh, depressed patients actually have, it's like a tree that's been paired off. So there's many less branches and uh, connections. And um, uh, so you can, um, over time, uh, you can think, you know, your brain is, is uh, it's kind of like a muscle where uh, if you use certain things, uh, those pathways get stronger. And if you don't use other other pathways, they, they kind of disappear, they atrophy. Um, and so uh, the, the thoughts, the negative thoughts, negative feelings um, that are represented by these millions of branching patterns, they're kind of like... Um, tracks in the snow where you went down this track again and again and again Mm -hmm. and it's very deep and they ultimately it becomes very hard to get out of them you can't go to the right or left your skis are stuck in the spore you know and um so uh so that's one thing that happens in the brain and there's also um that's uh, you know um, just post that a little that's very interesting because you know what you said that you know it could be it could be on the one side you had some major major traumas as a as a younger person or you had small stress over a longer time which is what many people have now Hmm. these days people even say it every day like yeah. I'm stressed, I'm stressed, you know, it's a word that you, it's, it's something that's been normal to say, but not normal to try to fix. Mm, mm. It's just like, yeah, I'm stressed. Okay, you're stressed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to sort of just quickly circle back to, you know, why, uh, why this is happening in, or, you know, in yeah. our society, uh, you know, I'm sure you've, uh, heard about um, uh, you know Johan Hari talks about it the um, the rat park experiment. Yeah, I heard yeah. about it, but please yeah. tell it to the. Yeah. Um, well, it's just uh, so it was a experiment they did in Canada with um, uh, with rats, um, showing that uh, it was. I mean, it was, this was looking at addiction and why people, um, or why rats uh, get addicted, and and the, basically what they found, and this this study has been somewhat criticized later, but in in the um, in this study uh, they found that you know rats that were isolated in cages, um, you know, became addicted to heroin and. Uh, I believe it was heroin they were using in the study. Um, yeah, because they have the option to take... Yeah, heroin yeah. or water. And um, and uh, whereas, you know, if you design the environment uh, like a rat paradise with lots of cheese and fun, interesting environment and you can have contact with, you know, your rat friends... Rat uh, bros. <laughs> that there was uh, much less addiction, mm. um, and but I but um, in the context of um, you know stress, all our like everything we know about stress comes from exper- experiments like this. So you know we did horrible experiments in psychology in, in the sixties and before that. Uh, you know, uh, basically putting animals, uh, isolating them in a cage with unnatural light, without contact. And if you think about it, what is modern society? Hmm. It's we're in boxes in a natural environment, isolated. So in a, in a sense, <laughs> it's kind of like a little bit of the, you know, rat park uh, thing. Um, but uh, But yeah, there's a lot of just chronic low-level stress in in our mm. world. Um, and I heard the uh, the parallel story to the rat heaven story is that uh, uh, people that went to the Vietnam War, I think, yeah, yeah, 
there was also a lot of opium or heroin addiction there uh, because of the terrible stuff that happened and loneliness and war and you had to do something to cope with it all and what they saw when they returned especially to the US because there they started to look at it was that those who came back to a life a good life with family or friends uh, most of them stopped yeah, yeah. with the opium addiction yeah. but those who came uh, back home who were alone hmm. they continued yeah yeah absolutely yeah and that's uh, you know the the point uh, that Johan Hari makes uh, which is uh, that the opposite of addiction is connection hmm. um, um, uh, yeah it's very very interesting and uh, I want to talk a little bit about because now we better understand you know the the big picture and and a little bit about why people get depressed get PTSD but what's wrong with you know today's solutions what we are using today yeah um, how do they work and you know uh, yeah, so I, I think, um, I don't know if it's what's wrong, but the thing that we need to improve is that, um, is two things. Uh, one, today's solutions uh, don't work for everybody. Hmm. They work for some people. Do we know, like, is it like a percentage or? Yeah, so there was like the biggest study ever done on, uh, for example, antidepressant treatment. Um, uh, this so is called the star D trial and, and, um, basically about 50% of people with depression fail, uh, the initial antidepressant treatment. Um, and then at least 30% of people, uh, will never respond to antidepressants, you know, after four or five antidepressants and they just... We call that treatment resistant depression. Mm -hmm. um, it's resistant to the treatments that we have. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. um, so, so there's a huge, and if you think about how many people suffer from depression, if, you know, half of people don't respond initially, and then, and these things take a lot of time. So, so one is that um, they're not very effective. They're, they're effective. For some people, for some people, it's absolutely uh, very effective. Uh, psychotherapy can be effective for mild, moderate depression, um, and um, and uh, and antidepressants, um, you know, have a modest effect uh, for in in general. And for some people, they really help. Um, but there's a huge uh, group of people that don't respond to either of those treatments and psychotherapy isn't uh, effective for deep depression so really severe depression um and um uh so so that's that's the first problem the second problem is that um uh you know in terms of medication the we don't really know why antidepressants work, uh, but uh, um, but to some extent, I think it's reasonable to say that they're symptom management. So, you know, if you if you have a rock in your shoe and your foot hurts, you could take paracetamol, and it might help you walk, and hmm. it's and it'll that's good. If, if you can walk and you have less pain, that's good. But, but it's not a good if, you can, <laughs> if you could, if there was a way to take the rock out of the shoe, that would be a much better approach. Yeah. And so that's, that, yeah. that's where these new uh, treatments um, come in is the, the um, you know, their transformative change uh, that happens very quickly that um, appears to address the very physiologic changes that we see in, uh, you know, depression in the brains of people with depression. Mm. So you're actually addressing 
the problem in the sense of the problem in the brain um you know you, whatever not the cause whatever the cause was but you're addressing the the physiologic changes in the brain um and then like taking a rock out of your shoe you know uh transforming uh the patient into um into a healthier state so that they actually don't need to take any medicine yeah if the rocks out of your shoe you're good mm. uh, so today the most you know uh, antidepressants works as like a numbing like a, a pain numbing more of a you know put it on a break and uh, hopefully it will go over or yeah i wouldn't go so far as to say i i i like using that analogy but there's uh we don't really know how okay. how uh, oral antidepressants work the whole concept of your too low serotonin that was an old theory that is mm. um people still talk about that but that's uh that's not it's much more complex than that so we don't actually know why they help no, no. no and they may have you know they're they're they may have some effect on neuroplasticity which is increasing the number of branches and connections um uh, between the brain cells which is how uh, that's the fundamental um mechanism of ketamine yeah. and um and other uh serotonergic psychedelics as well and last thing before we move over to that is like um how long time do you usually go on antidepressant? Is it very different or is it usually over a longer time period? Yeah, I mean, well, there, you know, drugs are tested over very short periods of time. And um, um, so we don't really know what the consequences are of taking drugs for years and years. And But um, uh, it's different, you know. Some some people can get out of a just have a depressive episode, and they, you know, take antidepressants for six months or something, and they go off. Um, other people have, you know, chronic depression and mm. will take it for twenty years. And, yeah. Um, and and the other uh, you know issue that. Uh, these new medicines uh, address is is that is that aspect of it is taking something every day and it's not that it's just irritating to have to take a pill every day it's that there are side effects um, so there's some are minor some are really important you know serious side effects uh, which could your, be like you can have problems with your metabolic system, heart disease, mm. um, and then things that affect your life, uh, gaining weight, uh, yeah. not being able to get an erection. Uh, yeah. These are, you know... In, That's stuff that can make you depressed again, so... Yeah, so, so if there's a medicine that you can take that helps fix the problem, and then you don't have to take any medicine uh, in between however many treatments you do, uh, that's a... a a, a big benefit mm. so now we can get into the let's start with the ketamine because that's what we do here in, in Norway now uh, how did we get started with this in Norway and and you know uh, and and what's been the process and how does it work yeah uh, so um, so ketamine is an old drug uh, synthesized in 1962. It was uh, it was uh, a um, um, an anesthetic. So it was synthesized as a alternative to PCP, angel dust, phenylcycladine. Um, that was a good uh, anesthetic, uh, but it had uh, side effects and uh, was long lasting and. Uh, so they synthesized ketamine, which is one of the best anesthetics uh, in the world. Um, it has um, this quality that you can uh, put somebody to sleep, uh, but it doesn't affect the body. So it, <laughs> it, uh, they breathe, their blood pressure is fine. So you don't need an anesthetic machine. So this is so ketamine is used in. Uh, we use it for children. Uh, we use it for uh, all over the world in places where you don't have uh, 
the equipment to help somebody breathe and, and uh, take care of their blood pressure uh, during a surgery, for example. So this is incredible. Uh, it was a game changer in medicine. Wow. Um, and, um, and it's incredibly safe. Uh, uh, so that's why we, we use it in children. You can give a hundred times the dose uh, to a four year old and they don't, they just sleep for a couple hours and then yeah. they wake up and they're totally fine. Wow. Um, uh, so, so really important medicine. It's, it was, F, uh, FDA approved in 1970, uh, approved in Norway, I think in 1973 or four. Um, and it's, it's, it's used all over the world. Um, you know, it's but then for for like it, more medicine and not initially for uh, anesthesia. Yeah. And then what we call procedural sedation and then um, uh, pain management. Um, so it's been used for over 50 years. Um, and, um, then, um, about is, well, in the, in 1970, when, um, when the psychedelics were, um, outlawed, uh, in the U S and then elsewhere, um, many of the people that were working with uh, psychedelics as potential, potentially helpful agents in mental health, um, they um, were looking for other agents to use. And um, ketamine is, is a legal uh, medicine and it has uh, powerful psychoactive properties. Um, it's not a psychedelic in the in the sense of a, it's not a serotonergic classic psychedelic. Uh, it works in a totally different way, but um, but it has powerful psychoactive properties. And at that time, uh, there was still this um, type of therapy that was that was uh, popular called psycholytic therapy, which is um like you know when freud used cocaine and opium and barbiturates and with his patients and himself as yeah. well but but to you know to try to get them in a different state of consciousness and work with them in psychotherapy uh so there were many uh therapists uh in um uh, central and south america and uh um and then in um, Iran and, and Russia that started working with ketamine uh, in their in their uh, psychotherapy. And um, but it wasn't really picked up by medicine. Its usefulness for um, depression wasn't picked up uh, until um, 2000. The first study uh, was done um, on depressed uh, patients uh, with ketamine. Uh, showing that it had a profound effect that started within hours, and um, and then over the last twenty years, there's been a lot of research, um, which went slowly because there was no pharmaceutical support for the research because it's a generic medicine that you can't make any money on. So there was so there were uh, it was yeah. So you can't take a patent on it exactly. Yeah, good. So it took a long time. Uh, you have something that is more effective than anything we had at the time. Twenty years ago, we knew this, or we had a, a you know the first study. Um, so over the ten years after that, there were a lot more studies, and then finally, about a decade ago, we started using this mainstream in the U.S. Um, uh, so. Uh, uh, so it's over the last 10 years it's been used in the U.S. and for depression treatment. And um, about, uh, so about six years ago, I guess, was sort of when I was thinking about doing something different mm. and making, uh, trying to, you know, make a change in a different way to help people and to focus on helping people be happier and not just uh, live longer. Um, I, uh, I became aware of this area. Um, it was actually when I was at the, um, the, um, 
the university, I was going to write a thesis on something. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write a thesis, I don't need a master's degree. But if I'm going to write a thesis, I might as well do it on something interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, and my, uh, my dad sent me an article from the New York Times about these Norwegian researchers that were doing wrote some article about uh, the meta-analysis on LSD, and they were interested in getting this research going in Norway. Um, that uh, the guys that started the Emma Sophia organization. Yeah. And so uh, so I contacted them uh, and uh, uh, was interested in doing, you know, some kind of research project that I would do a master's on, do, do a, uh, write a paper or something, and... Um, uh, that didn't um, turn into anything uh, there, but but it uh, but that's how I got into the um, this field, and then started learning more about it, and and um, you know quickly realized that okay, if I'm going to look into these uh, things as as uh, potential treatments, um, you know the other stuff is research. Um, but there's this agent ketamine that is available and it's not being used and uh, or highly underutilized uh, glo- so why, why globally. Why is it not being, being well, used? Why, why? Well, so, uh, well, you know, there, you know, part of, well, it was being used in the U.S., um, but uh, it's, you know, part of the reason why people weren't doing it was that they're you know they they continued looking for more studies um that we you know we want these big huge randomized control double blind double blind placebo controlled studies um that are normally done by the pharmaceutical industry because hmm. they and cost you, a lot they of cost money and tons of money and so what we had with you know in the last 20 years we there's tons of research on ketamine but there's up until recently there were much smaller trials um short-term trials that were incredible uh had incredible results but we didn't have these long studies that you you know pharmaceutical company can can do so that was part of it the other part of it is that it's a little scary the for you know it's, it's it works in a totally different way Uh, it's not a drug the psychiatrist can just like write a pill for, you know, write a, a prescription for, um, and, you know, go pick this up at your pharmacy. It requires a lot of knowledge and, and you have to learn how to do the procedure. Um, and, um, and, uh, and it's, you know, something very new to the field. So, so there's a big learning curve and, um, And there is some uh, some component in even in medicine of, of like stigma that oh, ketamine because most people that aren't emergency doctors or anesthesiologists don't even know what ketamine is and the the only time they've heard about it was oh yeah that's like a club drug people yeah. tell you it's like a special K it's a drug of abuse so so there was a lot of misinformation and lack of information in the medical field uh, that prevented people from uh, uh, from using it um, and um, anyway so yeah so five years ago I opened a clinic in the US uh, first academy clinic there uh, the first one in the state of New Mexico and then um, three years ago opened uh, the axon clinic in, in Oslo yeah I've been, and, I've been there yeah I sat in the chair It, yes it looks feels amazing yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good chair absolutely. yeah <laughs> um uh so you know and then i will say that you know i didn't uh initially intend to start a clinic i what i did is i emailed the head of the norwegian psychiatric association i Uh, emailed every you know the all the departments uh, the psychiatric uh, psychiatry departments at all the major hospitals and said uh, let me come and I'll give you a lecture about ketamine we'll talk about this and we'll set up a committee and we'll establish uh, Norwegian guidelines and we'll get this into the public health system that was my goal 
And of course, nobody replied to me. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, well, you're, you know, this is an American emergency doctor. Like, I'm not <laughs> going to listen to Who's this dude coming yeah. with uh, and, telling us um, what to do? <laughs> yeah, and this is our specialty. And I'm, um, so, uh, so then I said, okay, well, I'll just do it. It's yeah. legal. And uh, I know how to use this medicine. I've used it for 20 years. I'm going to do it myself. And um, that's what I did. Um, the, you know, there was an initi initially um, re a lot of resistance and skepticism uh, from psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, and um, and they uh, there was a evaluation by the Filkeslege, um, and uh, you know I just sent them back a twenty page document with a hundred scientific references and fifteen meta analyses of the of the research and. I said, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so, and then it was, it's, you know, been a process of just trying to educate people. Um, um, you know, there, there are a number of what we call like biological psychiatrists uh, in, Nor you know, psychiatrists who, who focus on pharmacology as opposed to um, just uh, more, psychotherapy and some antidepressants um but it's that's uh, it's uh, it's the minority uh in my experience here in norway um but you know they, they had they knew some of the they had seen some of the literature on this and and slowly over time um uh more and more people you know read the data uh, saw the studies um and then uh, you know, in, in addition to saw the results of of people's lives who were totally changed. Uh, you know, um, when if a psychiatrist has somebody who they've been treating for like twenty years with chronic depression in and out of the hospital, suicidal, and they've tried all the medications and maybe even electroconvulsive therapy, and and then you go to the ketamine clinic and seventy percent of them are better the wow. next day. That's a powerful thing to see for that doctor, and then yeah. uh, you know, and then that can change your mind about oh, maybe this is something. You know, the proof is in the pudding. If you, I could, I could tell people about data, but if they see somebody who's like back to work two weeks later, and they're it's they're, a big difference um, looking at a paper and looking someone in the eyes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so seventy percent. Or can you tell me a little bit like about how the results are and yeah, yeah. first that maybe and then maybe how the or how the actually process works? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, before I'll say, I just I'd uh, finish a yeah. th one thought. Just that you were asking about how this process came to Norway. And, uh, the final thing of you know the the closed loop of what I was trying to do. Just in November, we opened the first uh, ketamine treatment program in a public health system at uh, Siku Sosfold. Amazing. Um, and, uh, and now we do it at DPS Moss as well. And, um, and I'm working to start DPSs all over the country right now. So there's a lot of interest and, um, um, and uh, it will be more and more available in in the public health system, which I think is really important that it that it's there. Um, You're doing an amazing job. Well, it's a important. Uh, it's important. It's an important mission. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, the efficacy of, of ketamine, so uh, like, uh, what, uh, yeah. Before we go into that, like. Uh, what kind of patients come to you? Like, what's the criteria to be able to get ketamine? Yeah. Um, so we have most evidence for what's called treatment-resistant depression. So um, in, a, in other words, most of the studies that have been done are with patients that failed s at least two different antidepressants, uh, and they're still serious, uh, severely depressed. Um, so this is people that you know they've been having depression over a longer time. Maybe they've tried 
different yeah. antidepressants yeah and it doesn't work yeah um so that that's where we have the most data on um uh and in those patients so people that are treatment resistant really sick people often that are suicidal and really uh suffering uh, 70% are better within 24 hours. Um, and the response, we define that as more than 50% reduction in your symptoms. And about 30% go into complete remission, like wow. no depression done. Um, the It must be amazing for you to be able to see that. Yeah, it is. It's totally incredible. And, and as you really said, rewarding. when they go back to their doctor and they're like, what? Oh, fuck, I've been working with this for years. Yeah. Nothing works. Yeah. No, it's amazing. And, I've, you know, I've seen people that, you know, like I said, you know, have tried so many things over years and years. And um, and uh, so, it's, you know, it's rapid. It's uh, extremely effective. It's as effective, uh, if not more, than ECT, than electroshock therapy. Uh, we're studying, there's a big trial coming up, so we're going to, um, in Canada, they're doing a comparative trial right now. But, um, but uh, so that's of a single dose of ketamine. Uh, the, the durability of that is variable. So there's some people that get one shot and they're good. They're out of their depressive episode and they're, they don't need anything else. They're back on their feet. Um, but for most people that have like chronic depression over a long, long time, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, only a short, a single dose is only for a short period of time. So, so on the average, it sort of tapers off over by a couple weeks. Yeah, because um, as you said, you know, those connections in the brain have been yeah. disconnected for so long time that it's yeah. you know, hard to get them back rewired and working again yeah yeah so so we've uh so we found that if you give repeat doses um most people do like four to six treatments uh over a couple weeks to a month and um and then you increase the durability and then after that there's like three groups of people there's uh, one group that is good and they you know it's this is also in addition to everything else you're doing to improve your health uh uh in addition to good psychiatry psych, uh, psychology yeah. and um so um, we don't just like here you have the ketamine go it's more it's more holistic you look yeah at i mean the, the more that you do in addition to that the better and the longer course, yeah. you'll stay stay healthy um and then there's another group that does ketamine as needed. You know, maybe they're good for six months and then they kind of feel them um, slipping down and, and then they come back for a treatment. And the final group that does it as a treatment, not a cure, uh, but a treatment. So they may be in remission from depression, but they need the treatment once a month, for example. And it's hard to say who goes into those groups, but um, most, you know, the, if, if you've had depression for 40 years and that's often so it's still an, an amazing treatment and you're mm. doing great but it's something that you need to do like once a month but in in between those treatments you you know you don't have to take any medicine and many or many people can get off their other antidepressants which can be really helpful for other you know reasons if they're having side effects mm. um yeah. wow that's some that's uh incredible and and you know i've been visiting your clinic you know just to see it and it it doesn't look like a normal doctor's office so how does uh, this process works um for the person coming in yeah um well uh so the you know i mean in terms of the the space um you know it's a very intense experience uh, very powerful treatment um, and so it's really important to you know what we know about all psychoactive agents that put you into another state of awareness 
it's important to pay attention to the environment and the people around and so um you know that people feel safe and comfortable and um uh so that's part of it you know the 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 setting of the environment um and um uh, so there's a um you know the process is first um you know screening the person um uh, getting to know them and then telling them ab about the treatment and preparing them for what to expect uh, in in the treatment um and then the treatment itself it's um there's a lot of different ways that you can give ketamine you give it in any orifice you have yeah. or intramuscular or subcutaneous, you can breathe it in you can spray it. Um, but, uh, the best way is intravenous. So, so if you put it in the blood, we know a hundred percent of it goes in and I know the exact dose. Yeah. So, so it's very controllable. Uh, so you can control the experience, uh, and you can make it, you know, s start nice and slow and then, go a little deeper and then come out really nice and slow. Um, so the best way to do it, even though, you know, most people don't like needles, it's, uh, it's to do it uh, intravenously. As soon as uh, you put in the IV, uh, you forget yeah, about it and it's gone. Um, Just to make uh, the context better, you are in a beautiful room with art, with some plants, and you're sitting in a very comfortable, like half chair, half bed. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a uh, dina, uh, duvet mm. over you, and you have uh, uh, an eye mask, eye mask, yeah. eye cover, and you have music. Yeah. Yeah. It's a quite different setting and and way of doing it than you know a normal treatment. Yeah, and those are all things to you just paying attention to um, uh, trying to um, get uh, to a relaxed state. So you feel relaxed, you feel safe, you feel comfortable. Um, the eye shades are important because it, with ketamine, I'll explain sort of the, how it the, the the experience but it's a disassociative so you disconnect from your body and it during that time you don't really know if your eyes are open or closed so your eyes uh, so by wearing an eye mask you can just have an internal experience so if you feel like you're floating in the clouds over an island but then you open your eyes and then there's a, an office and there's somebody standing by you you're like whoa it's a, it can be confusing so that allows you just to have an internal experience the whole time. Um, and, uh, and then the music provides some support, some structure to, um, so it's not just complete silence uh, during the, the hour. Uh, the whole process takes about an hour. Um, I can, um, should I go into how yes, it works please. or how the experience is? Uh, like the mechanism of why it works in the brain yeah. or, or more I'd, just the would be interesting to learn um, I can uh, maybe just try to do that short shortly mm. really quick uh, the uh, so the two fundamental uh, things uh, that we know uh, one is that it increases neuroplasticity so it stimulates these new uh, branches and synapses connections between the brain cells so so it normalizes the effects of chronic stress in the brain so it's kind of like a root stimulator for a plant or a um, or an anabolic steroid that all of a sudden your muscles get all big it stimulates the growth of hmm. uh, essentially the muscles in your brain so it normalizes this thinning out of the the disconnect the connections in in the brain so that's w one uh, thing and and you can think of that as kind of like you know if we think about those uh, tracks in the snow that you're really deep ketamine by increasing neuroplasticity is like a fresh layer of snow over the mountain yeah and so it doesn't actually take away anything you still have all these old negative pathways you could use but you don't have to you could 
you could take that route and then just go to the right or left. So it, it gives people flexibility, um, resilience. Um, they can kind of go down a negative pathway and then eh, um, it goes over. You know, you move on to something else. So you kind of, in terms of how you respond to stressful things, it's more like a bamboo blowing in the wind mm. rather than an old tree blowing over. Um, Does it also open up like old ski ropes like old old tracks to like older memories or stuff that's been happening that you maybe have closed away um yeah in terms of the experience i mean i can uh let me get back to that yeah. that part yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other way it works which is just an important uh, uh point to touch on is is uh so on a higher level in terms of electrical networks in the brain, um, there's two important um, networks that, that uh, ketamine affects. One is this default mode network, the, the brain's resting uh, state of uh, thinking, the wandering mind, thinking about the future, ruminating over the past. And, and this is sort of something that's really hyperactive with people with depression and stress in general your i feel anxious i am depressed i am sad about that i don't know what to do about this you, sort of anything that starts with i this part of the rumination It's kind of goes over um, and over and and during the ketamine experience that is temporarily disrupted and then there's a shift afterwards uh, to a more balanced state to Uh, more of a flow state so you're more in flow more in the moment so the opposite of you know the wandering mind is is uh, when you're in a flow state when you're say you're biking really fast or skiing or having sex or dancing you're you're in the moment you know when you're there you're not dancing and thinking oh what am I going to do tomorrow I'm really stressed out about that thing or I'm so sad about this you're just there And in the present moment, it's actually very difficult to be stressed or, or, or sad. Um, and so, so there's a little bit of a shift in that direction to, from the ketamine. Um, and um, yeah, there's other mechanisms, which um, I, I don't need to go it's into. It's very interesting. And, uh, and I can see and understand why that can be very helpful for full helpful for yeah, people yeah yeah and and the you... the experience itself uh, there's actually um unlike um the, some of the other uh medicines similar to this um we actually don't know that much about how much the experience is important for the effect for just the antidepressant effect um so we know that there's certain amount of The effect. I mean, uh, you know, most people who who take ketamine who don't actually have a profound uh, psychoactive experience um, can actually have a profound positive antidepressant response. So there's there's a neurophysiologic change that happens with this neuroplasticity and the rebooting of these electrical networks. Um, in so we can actually have a you know positive. Uh, positive effect on your brain even though you didn't have like a big grand yeah and uh, i see this every experience day. so yeah. so you can you know i've seen people who their experience was maybe just confusing or boring or totally abstract or they couldn't they couldn't understand it at all or it was horrible they thought it was a uh, totally um, uncomfortable and hated the experience and the next day their depression is gone and other people who had profound uh, transformative uh, you know out of body experiences where they became one with god and the universe and felt a love that they've never felt before in their life and the next day there's no change at all so there's we don't really know a lot about the with ketamine the the connection between uh the like what are the factors in the experience that are predictive of a more positive outcome with depression uh that's not to say that you know we know that any experience regardless of what whether it's a drug or induced by 
looking at a sunset or just a great time with your friends experience changes us right so there there are consequences to experience and there are consequences to negative experience and positive experience um, but we don't really know which things are important when it comes to specifically the, the antidepressant effects we think and in my experience you know i've done over 3,000 treatments in the last five years um, and experience of my colleagues like in the u.s who have treated 20,000 people, uh, we, the consensus is that the experience matters um, and that it appears that, one, it's important that you have um, what I would call a transpersonal experience, uh, that you're you know, out of your body, but not just out of your body, but outside of yourself outside of the self that you get stuck in and all these negative patterns. So really getting to a dose where you are not only feeling just this out of body, like kind of floaty experience where, wow, I can't really feel my hands right now, but, but actually do I even exist? Hmm. Um, and getting to that state, uh, in my experience, um, is, is more effective and, and you have uh, more positive effects. Um, so having a transpersonal experience, um, and, um, in addition to that, there's, you know, certain themes that can be, have positive psychological effects, um, independent of other factors like, um, that are very common, um, with this treatment. And that would be, so first just altered perspectives, you know, we, we, when you're stuck in depression or anxiety, you're, you're often, I always do things this way. This is the way I am. I'm, I'm, this is how I do things. And, and, um, you know, very sort of rigid in your, in your thinking about you, your relationships, your place mm -hmm. You're in the world. kind of locked in yeah. your, your thoughts pattern is kind of locked in a loop. And so or having different perspectives, like even if they're weird or chaotic or bizarre, um, just having a different perspective, like, nah, it's not always like that. Hmm. It's actually could be like this. And just your brain just seeing that for a moment can be therapeutic and can just loosen up the rigidity of, of some of these patterns. Uh, so that can be helpful. Um, altered perspectives, uh, insight, you can have insights into, um, into things in your life, into yourself. Um, a very common experience uh, is uh, the overview effect, uh, which comes from astronauts who you go up into space the first time and you look back at the Earth and you you Whoa. realize, yeah, <laughs> this, this sense of, um, you know everything is still down there. There's all this war and chaos and you still fight with people about the dishwasher or whatever. That all exists, but in the big picture, it's not such a big deal it's okay mm. even all the suffering and terrible things the, getting a little perspective of stepping out um, uh, so that uh, is an important thing that can come up and then uh, and then also connection a feeling of experiencing not just knowing or intellectually that you know, say my atoms, you know, I know as a scientist, I know that, you know, the atoms that exist in my body have existed on this earth for billions of years. I recycled all this energy. The, the water in me has gone from the clouds to the rain, to the oceans, to the, uh, in the, all my ancestors. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's one thing to, to think about that. That's interesting. But to feel that, to experience actually it. experience that. So, so when you get dissociated, um, it's, not, it's not that you lose anything. Um, when you go outside of yourself, it's not you're losing anything. You're gaining something beyond yourself. So you become, instead of the box, the boundary uh, around the definition of what you are, your consciousness is experiencing dissolves and then you become part of the ocean and not just a wave in the ocean. And to experience that 
is really profound and has, I think, really therapeutic um, effects. Um, so that's another thing that, that people can have. Um, maybe I'll uh, just briefly describe like the experience of yeah. bit because uh, I guess it's is um, uh, so ketamine is it's beautiful. I'm I'm enjoying <laughs> your uh, your words. It's mm. uh, it's beautiful. Uh, how you say it, I connect it to you know everything. Mm. Mm. So you know, ketamine is um, it is the most ineffable, uh, indescribable um, medicine that that I know of. There's a couple other that are really, really indescribable, like this. There are there do exist some. So others. what you say is when people wake up, they're like, uh, "What? How mm, can I?" <laughs> it, I will say that it. It absolutely cannot be described. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anything that you do to try to describe it is, you know, it's just using metaphors. And is it harder to explain than other, for example, psychedelics? Absolutely. Yeah. Way more, way more than any hmm. in anything else. Um, um, there, it's possible that salvia divinorum may that that could people have a trouble explaining that as well but but um is so it's um and and you know uh i will say so ketamine has different effects at different doses so at a at a very high dose it's an anesthetic you go to sleep you're or at least we don't even know what anesthesia is but you're at least you do not report back anything so we you're we think you're unconscious um uh and you would think well <laughs> you know you could do surgery on the person and, yeah. and they don't move at least um and they don't remember the um at a very low dose it's it's uh, it takes away all the pain so it's used as you know pain uh, medicine in the US and in here as well um and then uh, in this middle range it's called the sub anesthetic dose um that's where it has these psychoactive properties so you so altered all your perceptions so all your senses are altered so you have um you can have you can see different things colors shapes uh, you can uh, your your sound changes um the your actual physical senses change um altered cognition you know your different thoughts feelings uh in uh, are altered um but so the the most unique part of it is the disassociative aspect that that you your consciousness your awareness is disconnected from the body and then at higher doses the self so at a at, at the the deepest level uh before you if you don't go unconscious so that the, what most people experience with the treatment that we do for depression is you start off you know, you're laying there comfortably you start to feel a little lighter and kind of like you're about to fall asleep and that you know you start thinking about different things and then um maybe you'll start seeing different shapes or colors um, and then you become less and less aware of your body uh, to the point of where there is no body is it is it uh, usually relaxing for people or is it stressful or is it you it's, know it's uh, it's usually a positive experience yeah. um, but it's so it's 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 like a dream in the sense of your conscious it's like a woke uh, a dream that you're awake in um so you're conscious the whole time but um but unlike a dream it's less concrete so it's much more abstract 
so the, there's really nothing that happens. It's not like, you know, in a dream or it with like the serotonergic uh, psychedelics, um, you can kind of go down a track. It's It could be narrative. You can go explore this particular thing um, and stay on it and think about it. Um, ketamine is more fleeting in, at, at these deeper doses where, where um, it sort of drifts by like clouds. Like you could have something that you experience and then it just drifts away and then something else. Um, people have described it as sort of like being on a train in space where you're looking out the window and then just all these, th- you know, and then there's something else and ah, oh, look at that. And then so it's it's um, it, it changes and it's moving. It's often floating. You can feel like you're floating around space and turning and twisting and getting stretched out. And, and then you become you could become really tiny, like an atom or a cell or a molecule. And then at the same time, you're aware of the entire universe. So it has a lot of paradoxical aspects to it. People describe feeling like, a, you know, there's everything and it's nothing at the same time. Um, uh, it was totally bright, but it was also totally black. Uh, and and that's, you know, the paradoxality of it, I think, uh, makes it very difficult to describe. And then when you're at the very, you know, at the deepest uh, point where it's just pure consciousness in the absence of anything, no thoughts, no feelings, no uh, you and nothingness and everything at the same time. Um, at that level, I think the closest thing way to describe it is just like a, the deepest meditation. So people that have meditated for a really long time. Um, very few people get to this point, but uh, uh, describe similar um, states of, of uh, consciousness where it's everything, it nothing, kind of transcend just, uh, into existence uh, in the absence of anything and all encompassing just being conscious. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's also really incredibly hard to describe because every experience is different and every experience with the exact same person with the same dose with the same music is totally different so one of ketamine um it it only um works on the receptors in the brain these nmda receptors that are active so and different receptors are active at different times. So every moment, if, if you did ketamine now and then in and two hours later, you would have an entirely different experience because your, your brain brains. is doing different things. Um, so sometimes, you know, people have very visual experiences. Sometimes there's nothing visual. It was just an experience. Um, sometimes it's very rich and sort of things that they could sort of try to describe and other times it's just there's literally nothing to say it's i it was that's a common thing for people to say mm. so you, know you say I'm, like how how it it just was yeah like, yeah i heard uh, and you know heard and experienced similar stuff from the uh, psychedelic scene but what's interesting that you talk about this you know uh all kinds of people come to you and try this and uh like what do they say after they had like a profound experience in their life yeah they wake up they're in the (laughs) office and like hello (laughs) yeah yeah no it's it's true you know and you know um uh, my you know people that need this treatment are all kinds of people and Mm. and um uh, n- uh, you know, most of them have uh, have never tried any type of psychoactive experience in their life. And, uh, you know, my oldest patient so far was a 97-year-old guy. Um, 97? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, many people say it's, 
it is the most profound experience they've ever had in their life. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a very powerful, intense um, experience. Um, and it can, you know, it's mostly positive, uh, sometimes neutral. Sometimes it can be a little scary and, and challenging, um, uh, uncomfortable, uh, confusing, um, anxiety producing. But it's not, uh, people don't have, uh, it's not like it's a bad trip per se, because there's no trip, there's no story. Um, there could be a moment that's, Maybe it's something dark or it's just like a feeling of something negative mm -hmm. or, you know, you just or it's just confusing. You're trying you're trying to hold control of, oh, you know, am I it, did I die? You know, yeah. that's that's some you know, that's something that As could come up uh, yeah. that that we discuss beforehand. You know, if you have this experience where you are questioning whether you exist or not, it's OK. This mm. is what the medicine does. And nobody gets harmed by this. So. It can't, you know, your physical body is fine. And like a dream, you're not, you know, everybody will come back. Yeah. So people don't not come back. And so, you know, that being said, it's it could still be very scary the first time you try something new and you, you're feeling like... It's like a roller coaster the first time. Am like... I existing? <sighs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but the nice thing about it is it's generally very... It just goes over into something else so it's a moment and then it changes into something different yeah like um, you said the space train yeah like whew, yeah we're wearing maybe compared to to for example mushrooms you can go on one path for, for, long, for hours. many hours yeah. yeah and and if people have uh anxiety or confusion um you know the nice thing about about it is you're conscious and and you can actually talk you could say something and uh, so uh, and if I see that um, that they're a little uncomfortable maybe fidgeting or kind of breathing a little fast uh, we give them support you know yeah. we, we uh, usually all that is needed is is just hearing you're safe everything is fine you know you're just go with the process and it just kind of goes over into something else. Sometimes they require, you know, holding their hand or putting your hand on their shoulder, or just mm -hmm. a little grounding to remind them that, ah, I have a body and it's fine and somewhere out there in, in this other place. What I think is so uh, interesting about this is like the pa patient are themselves the therapists in a way. You know yeah they are actually doing the the hard work the therapy mm. in their head in their mind yeah yeah absolutely um i i i think about it in in that way that you know ketamine is sort of a well you know there's in terms of the you know there are these specific uh, neurophysiologic effects that are happening because of the medicine but um in terms of their experience, it's it's like a, a catalyst that opens a door. And ketamine opens the door. What is on the other side of that door is kind of up to your brain. And um, and uh, most people describe it exactly like this. They feel like they, they go to where they need to go. They experience what um, uh, things that they, you know, they feel are therapeutic and... Um, um, I will say that, you know, you asked about like uh, previous memories. Um, the uh, um, so people with a lot of people with depression have had trauma um, and uh, and many also have, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so what happens with people that have like really severe traumas um, they can often have very fleeting because it's not so concrete. These experiences, they're maybe just a moment where they have this sense of that person in the room or, you know, something bad that happened when they were a child. And 
when this happens spontaneously in the experience, it's universally therapeutic. So wow. uh, everybody I've seen that experienced, you know, maybe relived, uh, they don't relive, but it, a moment where, you know, this, uh, ra- you know, the, when they were raped, they... they so say, sort of, say, say you're on the space train, you kind of, you look at that for a moment. Yeah. Like and this, that kind of opens the door. Yeah, to, or there'll be this kind of sense of, um you know that there's this that is coming up and when that happens there's most people describe looking at it kind of from the outside you know one of the problems with post-traumatic stress disorder is that instead of just being a memory you know most memories are that they're just a memory you could sort of draw it up yeah yeah that happened that happened. oh yeah that was terrible when i broke my leg i you know it really hurt but it's not activating you. It's just like put away in a box and you can, yeah, that happened, but it's not happening now. And people with post-traumatic stress symptoms are, it's continuing to activate them, um, you know, to sort of re-experience some of the fear, the the uh, anxiety activation that from that actual event. So it's still kind of linked to the stress response. And what happens when it comes up during ketamine is many people describe being separated from it and it's like ah oh, yes that's there that happened but i'm my awareness is here and that memory is over here um so it's essentially uh, like a um um sort of a desensitization therapy that happens in one hour instead of a year over you know with psychotherapy compress it into one hour yeah and it's not even you know it's not an intellectual cognitive process it's just it it just happens and we 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 know that ketamine is very effective or um uh is we know that it's very effective for post-traumatic stress disorder um um we don't know a lot of, about um, sort of what the best ways are to. Um, so in my practice, I let it happen spontaneously. So I don't I don't have them bring up the trauma before they do the uh, the treatment. Um, but if it happens spontaneously, which it often does, they have positive effects. Um, the there was a study so ketamine is also used for uh, uh, the treatment of addiction and um, uh, they did a great study in England where they showed that if you um, if you had um, heavy alcohol drinkers um, drink a little out uh, you know take a sip of a beer right before they got the ketamine it activates this maladaptive reward memory and then it gets reconsolidated during the mm-hmm. ketamine and they have a better response than just giving them the ke- so if you just give them ketamine uh, it's actually very effective for the treatment of alcoholism but um, if you activate the memory first and then give them the ketamine it's even better yeah so there's a lot of interesting things to learn there in, in terms of uh, um, how to to best, um, uh, you know, get, get the best therapeutic response. Um, and I would say maybe just a quick aside, uh, there's a couple different types of traditionally uh, doing ketamine therapy. There's uh, one called just ketamine treatment, and the other one is called ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And um, um, and the that one is is like um, similar, more similar to psycholytic therapy, where you you're taking a low dose where the person can still kind of talk and interact, and but they're in a slightly different state of consciousness, but they can still do some. They can hear the words that you're saying, and you can hear the mm. words there, um, and um, so the, that's one type of treatment. Um, what what I do is more not psycholytic, but uh, 
like they do with the psychedelics psychedelic therapy where it's it's the medicine does the work so it's a higher dose they have the experience that they um that they have and that any integration of perspectives and insights that come from it happen later as opposed to during the experience wow yeah. it's very interesting i know you know you have uh, what i read and what they study a lot on now is also mdma and psilocybin mushrooms can you say something about that why do we need those also and uh where how far have we have we come with the studies on on both of them yeah so um i will say that there, there are three completely different um drugs so uh, psilocin um mdma and ketamine are you know working completely different mechanisms with uh uh you know different uh, neuropharmacology uh they have you know that what they what they share is this um uh the the approach is similar a very powerful um psychoactive experience that has you know a, has the ability to have a transformative effect on your life in a very short period of time yeah. and that you don't have to take medicine every day uh you know maybe there'll be some set of number of treatments that you would do or um are, are like one of them uh stronger or more potent in the way that you don't have to do them that often do we know that um yeah that's a that's a very good question so so uh i would say so ketamine and psilocybin are um those have some similarities uh their similarities in in the mechanism of, of how they work in the in the positive effects that they have on the brain uh with stim they, they both stimulate neuroplasticity and they both um seem to um, uh, temporar temporarily disrupt the default mode network um, and they're both very uh, well ketamine we know is very effective for depression psilocybin ap appears to be very effective we're st we're still not quite there in terms of having all the the studies that uh, we'd like to have um, it's um, we're getting ready to do for psilocybin um, phase three research which is sort of the last big trials to uh, uh, to uh, confirm that the smaller trials that are very promising um, on a bigger scale if you know we confirm the efficacy of for depression um, so uh so with that we're um you know so i would back up and say so i'm i'm also an overleg at uh siku sosfold um and uh i'm a uh, the medical advisor for our research group called uh seek forsk at uh, at dps nordra ostfold and we have a research team there uh, that uh, is working on um, you know innovative approaches to mental health um, we um, initially started with a uh, phase two uh, trial psilocybin for treatment resistant depression um, that last year got uh, turned down by the Staten's Lego Middlewerk, the regulatory agency, for technical reasons that had nothing to do with the medicine. It mm. was the trial design. They wanted a different uh, sort of statistical parameter measured. So just to um, understand, it's like stage zero or one on animals or people? Yeah, well, so there's what we call, uh, there's what we call preclinical work on animals. And then, um, and then there's uh, clinical trials where we do, we start off with healthy volunteers. So you just take healthy people and test out the medicine. So first you test it out on animals. Is that um, like stage zero or one? Or is it? I don't know if they call it stage <laughs> zero, but one would be the healthy trials. Okay. 
Um, and then so, you do it on a smaller group, like. And then you do a smaller group of so phase two would be you know small group of uh, people with depression, for yeah. example, and then um, and then phase three are these larger um, uh, trials that can conf- that are statistically powerful enough to uh, to show that okay this is actually as effective as it looked like. Um, so uh, so there's. Um, an international group, uh, um, but you did um, um, in Norway. Yeah, you have done stage one on no. psilocybin, or no? In not? in Norway, we were um, we were almost. Uh, I mean, we went quite far with the, a phase three, uh, phase two trial for uh, psilocybin for depression, um, but uh, that was. Um, stopped by the, or it wasn't stopped by the ligament of work, but basically, they wanted a change in trial design, which yeah. um, which we couldn't do because it was an international study. And if you change one thing, you can't change it for each country. It has to do the same study. Everybody has to be on the same page. So, so I mean, this that, is now like a collaborative worldwide thing that's happening. Yeah, it's a it's a multi-center uh, international um, trial uh, the the main investigators um, at Oxford uh, psychiatrists at Oxford and um, it's one of the the largest um, trials um, I think it will it will be the largest uh, psilocybin trial ever done mm. um, and and we are planning to go into the phase three uh, part of this trial so so we'll be getting back to that maybe next year yeah um uh so that's where that is at uh, um it's it's uh, it's very promising for um depression and um uh, to the point where the the fda in the united states has given um uh, special status to it as it um uh Blanking on the, the like a, word for it, but uh, yeah, I heard it before. Like, yeah, like a progressive or something. Or like, a, yeah, it's, you it's, have the stamp to go yeah, faster. It means that, in other words, if um, if the phase three study comes out the way we suspect or hope, uh, that if they if there's promising results, then it will be a, a approved medicine in the United States. And same thing in the European Union. And so. what's the theory? What's the like? Uh, number of people or like how how many have to be cured to be able to say yes we have um it. do you know that yeah there's not like a specific number it has to be big enough that depending on the trial design uh, and a lot of other factors the statistics yeah. have to be right so it's a statistics issue um and not just one trial but several different uh, big trials have to be done um to to go quickly back to you asked the good question would you know asking about these different drugs um so in terms of depression um in the small studies we have with psilocybin it appears that it's much longer lasting than so that it's more durable than than ketamine um uh, in terms of a, a single dose so um that um, you know, a single dose of psilocybin could have uh, positive effects that last much longer than, on the average, what we see with uh, with ketamine. We don't know, um, and it, you know, they're completely different drugs. So there could be a variety of different reasons there, but but one of them is that um, it's there's a lot of psychotherapy that goes into the psilocybin. Uh, assisted therapy program and so it's possible that that actually um, we we haven't in with ketamine we actually have not done uh, comparing just the medicine and the experience to uh, the medicine and the experience uh, with uh, compared to additional psychotherapy mm-hmm. so um, and we intuitively think that it you know makes sense that you if you have in these the psilocybin research you have a lot of intense integration therapy 
Um, so it, it intuitively makes sense, but we... Is that also yeah. because it's a longer experience? So we have to kind of prepare people for the, yeah. for the trip, for the ride? Um, yeah, maybe to some extent. Um, um, I mean, my theory is that it's actually... Is, so if it in fact is, is a longer uh, response with, with Silas Ivan, um, my theory is that it, it actually has a lot to do with uh, the abstract nature of the ineffable nature of ketamine versus the more concrete, understandable yeah. nature of psilocybin. Because it sounds, it sounds logic, you know. Yeah, uh, because you know, there's the physical effects, but then there's if you have an experience that you can really clearly remember and you can you can think about and it makes sense to you, you can learn from it. And, um, you know, states of awareness become traits of our personality by learning and by, um, you know, thinking about the experience. So if you, you know, experience something and then don't think about it at all afterwards, it sort of easy, easily disappears. Um, and because it's such an abstract, hard to describe experience, the, the ketamine, it's hard to make, like, what do I make of that? I, yeah. I don't know what to make of it. It was, what it was uh, yeah, it yeah. was just in another dimension, um, as opposed to where you're much more cognitively intact with the, with psilocybin or with MDMA, um, where you can like really for example, think. On, yeah. For example, on ketamine, you would maybe like get an image of the trauma or something that happened in your life but on psilocybin you can actually go deep into that trauma yeah for yeah, hours yeah yeah and particularly with M mdma yeah so that that goes to your other uh point about you know how uh, these things can be used differently um so psilocybin and ketamine for depression um we uh, at Sikorsk, um, uh, one of our team members um, is doing a PhD on using MDMA for depression as well, um, and um, and so that's uh, that's something that is going to be looked into. Um, but but right now, what we know is that um, uh, MDMA appears to be most helpful for. Um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, for for traumatic uh, events and going into it and it's sort of a, a molecule that's well it's, it's it's like as if it was designed specifically for for um, um, psychotherapy with trauma um, and um, it, whereas the other agents uh, um, may have many other uh many other indications that they get really effective but so far um the the most data we have is for for depression that being said um you know when you uh, so ketamine has been studied for all kinds of things um ocd anxiety um you know substance use disorders um uh pers um uh uh, eating disorders, um, and if you if you think about it, you know when you hear about there's some drug that's good for everything, it usually means it's just bullshit. Yeah, uh, you know, so, yeah, it cures this, this, and that. Um, but the thing is, is that both um, you know, ketamine and, and the serotonergic psychedelics, w the, their mechanism is is specifically addressing one of the fundamental problems with many um, uh, uh, mental illnesses, which is um, rigid patterns of thinking, feeling, or behavior that you're stuck in. So ultimately, they're all the same in, in some in level, like, in this mm. very crude way to describe it, that, you know, addiction is a you know, it's a pattern of behavior, of thinking, feeling. Um, 
that you get into this pattern was this, you know, anxiety is negative patterns of thinking, depression, these negative patterns of thinking and feeling. And so to some extent, it doesn't really matter so much what you're stuck in. It's just you're stuck. And, and, and it can be so stuck shaking by eating, it up a little yeah. bit and, and rebooting the system and getting that fresh layer of snow and kind of decreasing the rigidity of patterns can be effective for a lot of different things. Um, and um, So all yeah. of them can be, in some extent, used for many kinds of mental issues but some of them are stronger than others of course on, on specific ones yeah, yeah 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 so and there's a lot to be done a lot of research to be done here um, um, but uh, but it's an incredibly promising field um, mm -hmm. where you know we see responses that you you don't see with anything else you know um, um, other than electroshock therapy which is kind of like using a hammer instead of a screwdriver so there's some negative consequences to that but yeah it's it's gotten better over the years but it's still so that kind of shocks you out of the of the box you're in yeah but this kind of yeah it's a little more uh, subtle and doesn't have the um i would choose that yeah mo <laughs> most most people would yeah yeah do you want mushrooms or should i shock you <laughs> <laughs> it's like well <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i mean there there are uh you know i will say there it's not like it, it everybody there are people that um uh, th that would not be helped by ketamine certainly the the others as well and they all have their specific um both indications and contraindications so so each one you know mdma has a very small um uh increased cardiac risk because it's a stimulant and so it increases um you know for people with certain risk factors it could be dangerous uh, even at you know safe doses um and uh with um with um the serotonergic psychedelics the you know people with uh, psychotic disorders um could have a really bad experience and an exacerbation um or triggering of pre-existing psychosis mm. and that's not good no um you know we don't treat people with history of psychosis with ketamine although it appears to be safe to do so because we we um we treat um so it doesn't help it doesn't help their psychosis uh but it doesn't trigger um worsened psychosis in uh um we use it as a, a medicine for agitated psychosis in in the emergency room um um, but anyways, there's there's a variety of you know uh, conditions where it you would um, it would not be beneficial for yeah. So like looking uh, looking ten years in the future, where do you think we are with all of these three three medicines? Well, I mean, I think looking one year in the future, um, ketamine will be available in you know most uh, DPS uh, hospitals here in in Norway, um, um, uh, because it's safe, it's effective, um, and um, and, it can help and it's a available. A lot of people, it's, you know, it's it's a medicine that's been approved for fifty years, so we we know we know it. Um, the other things that were you know research the research has to be done there's several more years of research to be done um but uh, presuming the uh the results of of uh, the research are as promising as the early trials um uh, we expect both 
to be approved um you know within the next five years absolutely and there'll be mdma psilocybin yeah 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 um and um you know that there will be approved medications mm. that are um available to get at your psychiatrist yeah um in a in a um supervised setting in a safe way where the right people can get it and they can be screened and and assisted in in a in the best way possible mm. like i'm i'm just thinking you know um i come from the rave culture the rave scene and you know everyone knows that people there use mdma for the events and i just wonder like 10 years in the future a big issue with with that is of course you don't buy clean mdma on the street you don't know what you buy mm. and i'm just wondering if if that will change 10 years 10 years in the future do you think that it will be an option to buy so don't go buy shit on the street but here's some safe stuff do you think we will get there one day yeah i mean you're you're asking if i mean will we have uh more legalized yes uh, uh yeah it's certainly possible you know i mean it's happening in the in the u.s uh, mm. right now um you know roost reform is is uh right happening um didn't happen this year but it'll probably happen next year yeah it's just um, the beginning but um but there are you know so there are there are good reasons to um you know many people feel like oh if if these are really effective medicines uh they should be available to everybody and we should there's why you know why should we not be able to use them um but there there is you know the other side to that is that um there is a uh a benefit to evidence-based medicine of course um, of course that but when that evidence comes yeah and then you know so when the evidence is there the the question is are there safer ways uh to do it and um you know i mean it, it depends what you're talking about but if you're talking about the treatment of a serious uh, medical condition yeah not then you know if you're talking about recreational use that's an entirely different conversation yeah. <laughs> but uh, i mean me talking about this as a as a doctor you know i think it doesn't you know what is it, even if there's something available that is a useful treatment mm. if you have a serious medical condition uh whether it's a mental or physical condition um you know it's important to um you it can be a lot safer to do it um, i totally agree in the safest way possible where you get the most support possible yeah. you, you know, don't want to go and buy uh, ketamine and go home and try it you know it's it's much better to have a safe place with people that know what will happen yeah exactly and can help I mean, you through it and of course after it too yeah yeah absolutely um and you know it's um you could compare it a little bit to say midwifery like uh you know having a baby um i don't know if this is the greatest analogy but <laughs> but you know you can have a baby with uh, you know at home um and we've been doing it for millions of years it mm. works just great and this is a um we have the technology to have a baby you know we can a uh, bucket of water and a pair of scissors and um but and it goes fine most of the time um but uh, if it doesn't go fine um you know there are these you know these these drugs are really powerful drugs and um, you know particularly for um you know for certain risk groups uh they can have risks and mm. and uh 
So I think there's something to be said for having um, this treatment available in the medical system. Um, if that system works and if that system is um, uh, you know, providing the good service to, mm. to people. And Let me ask uh, that question in another way, like not, not in a legalization way. How will it help, you know, after, uh, how will we see a different uh, story about mental health within like 10 years, if this becomes available for doctors? You yeah. Know, will it well, be a change? I mean, it's already, you know, transforming um, our I ideas about mental illness. Um, we're learning so much about the brain from how the these drugs work on the brain. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, really changing the paradigm in mental health treatment from that kind of symptom management to, to really more transformative change to try to get people back to health. Um, so I think it'll, I mean, it'll have tremendous effects on the people that are suffering and also um, on on our society in, in general. I think it's going to have a, a, a huge effect. And I, I don't know how and you know that will remain to be seen but um but i think this is definitely the most exciting thing happening um in um in mental health right yeah. right now absolutely must be amazing to be a part of it yeah it's it's uh absolutely it's actually amazing. every day see the results yeah i mean that's that's the most important uh, part is is um you know, actually getting to see um, people uh, in sometimes over hours go from, you know, tremendous suffering to mm -hmm. to um, um, being healthy. Um, and um, yeah, and also, you know, seeing the consequences of changing the, the system is is really uh, rewarding. Um, you know, knowing that not just the patient that I will treat that day, but that there's other clinics opening up and then and that this is available in you know other parts of the healthcare system. And you know it's a it's a many patients will say to me, like after they're in remission, um, how sad they feel about you know their friend that killed themselves five years ago and like had he had, had he had just known you know yeah. uh, I told the same story on this podcast uh, yeah. yeah you know like I wish he had the opportunity mm. to try it you know yeah yeah one of those three just mm. to test it because mm. he was at the place where he had tried everything mm. Mm. but not those kinds of treatments yeah mm. yeah absolutely and you know most people most people actually don't know about this uh, at all um those of you know so some people that know about it don't know that it's available um uh so so it is important um that that people know that at least you know ketamine is available right now it's totally legal it's not alternative treatment it's not some shamanic treatment it's a uh, approved medicine that has a 50-year track uh, record and is incredibly effective and and um you know is now also available in the healthcare system uh, even though it's not a lot of capacity there because um, there's you know people from all over the country trying to get in so mm. um um I'm getting excited for the future, especially that since we can now uh, help these people who have like living with the worst mental problems mm. and those living with it over a long, long time. And now we start to see, wow, there is actually something, mm. some of it's from nature, something we have made ourselves and it's working in new and profound ways. Mm. Mm. Wow. So if people want to read more about your work, 
or read more about this where can what should they google um well my my clinic is uh axon uh, dot no uh, a x o n clinic um for you know i've i've um, done some lectures and written some stuff in the media that uh they just googled my name uh Lawan Stewart um and um uh we don't our research group doesn't have a website right now but uh you're not bloggers huh <laughs> <laughs> one of um uh one source of uh you know new uh what's what's happening in this in this field uh would be uh we we made a um uh, an organization called the uh, Norsk uh, Forening for Psychedelisk Wetenskap. Um, so uh, nfpv.no, and um, people could. And they uh, have a newsletter. Yeah, there's a mm. newsletter, and you know, we kind of got shut down a bit by Corona, but um, in terms of having events, but we have uh, we have lectures. Um, and uh, we're going to have a, a large uh, conference, uh, Nordic uh, Psychedelic Science Conference next year. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, and hopefully as soon as things are opening up here in the next hopefully month or two, uh, we'll start having um, monthly lectures again and Great. Uh, focused on um, uh, psychedelic science, um, all aspects, not not just medicine, but mm. uh, the uh, academic pursuit of uh, more knowledge in this area. Cool. So I just have to say thank you for the amazing talk and the amazing work you're doing. Uh, it's been really cool to learn more about this and you know, probably for a, a lot of the listeners to learn that, you know, it is available in Norway, ketamine treatment, you know, if they, if they know about that kind of friend or person who really, really tried everything, this is actually an option now, which is great to know. So, uh, Loan, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you very much for having me. It's uh, been great to talk to you. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, good luck with the new studies. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.